I still can't believe you've never had a Red Bull. No. Wow. It, so it tastes like medicine. I, I'm not a fan of it myself, but yeah, not not good. <laughs> Welcome back to the Craftsman Online Podcast. This is a weekly half-hour program focused on the relevant topics in Freemasonry and the various aspects of the craft. Any opinions, thoughts, or viewpoints shared during this program are that of the individual and do not reflect the position of any Grand Lodge, appendant, or concordant body from which that member may hail. I'm your host, Brother Michael Arce, Editor-in-Chief of CraftsmanOnline.com, and I'm excited to bring him back on the pod. Brother Angel Millar joins us. Welcome back, Brother Millar. Thank you very much. It's good to be back again. Brother Millar is a member of Compact Lodge number 402 in the 4th Manhattan District and is back, or I should say, returning this week as we discussed meditation in Freemasonry. And this kind of started from a conversation that you and I had after one of our deeper esoteric Masonic conversations. And I feel that there's a very common misconception about meditation. So let's tackle that one at first, because I remember telling you, like, I would love to do meditation, but I don't want to sit here with my arms and legs crossed and be seeking this uh, moment of nirvana. How do you define meditation and how do you use this time to focus your thoughts? Typically, I would say it's um, uh, stepping out of the sort of rational uh, logic thinking uh, of uh, daily life, uh, not that we think logically that much, but stepping out of this sort of like more rational um, thinking, trying to problem solve and allowing the mind to kind of go within and to go kind of clear. And of course, thoughts are always invading our consciousness. This is something that um, can't really be avoided. Even in meditation, you get all these thoughts arise, but you're not pursuing them, whereas you might be in daily life or focusing on a particular problem and trying to solve it. You're more just trying to abide in consciousness, although it depends on what type of meditation you're doing, of course. Uh, there are different ones. Yeah. I want to give some background to the nature of this podcast. I had reached out to Brother Millar after a personal conversation. He's a hypnotist and He's got more than two decades of experience in meditation and related mindfulness training techniques. And I reached out to him to help mentor me through a situation that I was going through professionally that I thought a hypnosis session would be beneficial. And he agreed. It was the first time I ever did that. And after we had had that initial hypnosis session, which that is still with me today, we also met again to discuss meditation and how I could start incorporating that into my daily life. Yeah, so let's just begin with uh, hypnosis since you mentioned the term. So I, I do hypnosis with people for lots of different things. Confidence, you mentioned um, quitting unwanted habits. And you can also use it for meditation as well. And Israel Regarde, uh, an author that uh, probably a few listeners will know, um, uh, he was involved with the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn and its revival in America in particular. Um, yeah, he says specifically in one of his books that uh, hypnosis can be used to help people uh, to be beginning meditation and um, to really overcome obstacles of meditation with uh, you know, invasive thoughts and so on. So he recommends actually going to a hypnotist um, when you're beginning the journey of meditation. That's not really necessary, it has to be said, or it won't be necessary for most people. So, um, you know, how does hypnotism um, work? It, it is a kind of meditation that you're going within your own consciousness. Uh, once your brain waves are changing and you're going to more of a sleep state, and uh, one very small study recently found that the parts of the brain that work together actually separate while they're in while you're in hypnosis. So, so, so I think when you think about what does that imply, it would seem to me to imply that you don't get that kind of background noise or the interference of thoughts. You're very focused. I would say you're actually more focused than in than in meditation, you don't get this kind of interference. And uh, you're able to create this kind of lucid picture in your mind, which which then has a, a greater effect on your subconscious and on your long term thinking. So it has an it has an effect and it has an effect on most people um, who know specifically what 
they're interested in changing. Uh, and meditation is certainly similar. You, you're trying to block out this sort of background noise, this constant chatter uh, that, that goes on in the mind. We don't even notice it because we're caught up in our thoughts all the time. So meditation, you're trying to subdue this chatter and as i say nevertheless thoughts will arise after you know a few seconds 10 15 seconds but the difference is you generally speaking you're not pursuing those thoughts so let's say you, you're sitting down to meditate and you think about uh, the meal you had yesterday with someone or in your daily life you might start fantasizing about it but in meditation you're just going to allow it to just disappear and just allow your mind to go clear again. And then another thought will arise. We'll definitely get into the hypnosis session that I went through and also the guided meditation that Angel took me on. But here's what I found so fascinating is we were having this discussion on Freemasonry. We got into our professional lives, which, you know, is the great thing about our fraternity is that we can, you know, openly talk about what we do for a living. And I just found, you know, his career so fascinating in hypnotism and we were starting to get into some of the parallels of Freemasonry and hypnotism or meditations in Freemasonry. So can you give a little glimpse of, of that as well? Uh, let's think about where uh, the, the the world, the Freemasonry came out of, which is really uh, the European, European civilization. And I include uh, Britain and Ireland. And uh, I know some people are confused about that. But um, if you look at medieval Europe, uh, theologically, they had uh, this idea of ratio and intellectus. There's two different kind of states of consciousness, as it were. Well, I mean, you could say more than that as well, but there are these two main ways of thinking. And, and ratio is uh, rational thinking. It's basically the workhorse of the mind. So I have a problem. I need to solve the problem. So I'm going to think about how to solving that problem until I solve it so it's it's work whereas whereas intellectus is contemplation and the idea is that you're receiving something from the divine so if you are out uh, in a garden let's say and there's a rose and you look at the rose and you contemplate it and you just kind of absorb its image and you think about it and um, you become sort of involved mentally with it um, then you're you're contemplating it, that's intellectus, but you're also receiving something, something of the divine nature. That, you know, God created the world, you contemplate the world. Uh, ergo, you are contemplating divine nature. But beyond that, of course, it's also a more passive state. You're not trying to solve anything. Uh, you're just allowing whatever arises to arise. And uh, one, of the, one of the huge mistakes of uh, the modern world uh, of course, the West, but not just the West, um, is this idea that uh, really we are rational thinkers. Uh, we think rationally. And the only time we're not thinking rationally is when we're asleep. So we're either asleep or we're thinking rationally. And this is total nonsense, to be perfectly blunt. And, uh, and even a cursory thought will show that's not true. So you're asleep. Before you're fully awake, you're in the hypnopompic state, which is somewhere between between being asleep and being awake, or kind of drowsy. So that's already two different states. And then, uh, you know, you, maybe you're thinking rationally about something. That's three. But maybe you're daydreaming. Uh, maybe uh, maybe your your mind is blank. So all of these sort of states of consciousness we move through throughout the day. Not to mention these emotional states as well, anger and so on. And uh, we use rational thinking uh, very, very rarely, almost never really. Um, even when we think we're being rational, it's really informed by other things. Uh, um, you know, we might make a rational decision to um, buy a new computer, but that what computer we get or wherever we even need a computer is informed by advertising, whether our friend has one, how attractive it is. And how attractive a computer is, is is not rational at all. Not to go off too much of a tangent, but there's a sort of marketing genius called Rory Sutherland who talks about psychologic. Um, and the way we think about things is more about uh, psychologic. Uh, it's not really rational. And um, to give a really great example of how psychologic works, he says, if you want to 
Uh, if you wanted to be Coca-Cola, which is the world's number one uh, soft drink, um, then you, the rational thing to do would be to make it uh, cheaper, better tasting, and, um, and put it in a bigger can so you get more. And if you went into a marketing meeting or a product development meeting, everybody would agree that is the way to, to be Coke. But he points out the second best selling um, soft drink is Red Bull, which is in a smaller can. It's much, much more expensive. And I've never tasted it, but he says it tastes disgusting. Uh, so, But no one in a marketing meeting would say that's a great idea and that's going to be a real cont a contender to uh, you know, be Coke. Rational thinking doesn't work. We don't use rational thinking. We're not rational creatures. We can think rationally, but that's very rare. But um, but in regards to meditation and hypnosis, so we move all day through these different states of consciousness and emotions. And um, in a sense, meditation is sort of entering into this state of intellectus, this kind of contemplation, where maybe we're receiving impressions or maybe we're just allowing our mind to, to clear um, one of the benefits of just allowing the mind to go clear for a while is uh, Wilhelm Reich had this idea, so, uh, early psychologist had this idea that the sort of thoughts and anxiety and trauma it gets built up in our body and in our face, in our muscular armor, as it were. And you have to relax this. To re you have to relax the body to let go of these, this trauma in the body. And this is really true. And um, maybe one thing that's not really said very much about meditation is you also re relax your body to a great degree. I mean, you have to keep your head and spine upright. But, but otherwise, you, you should be relaxing your facial muscles uh, and the rest of the muscles in your body. And that's a big part of letting go of um, the, the thoughts that you're thinking throughout the day and that you hold on to and fantasize about and get angry about, uh, uh, all of which is terrible for the health. And long-term stress uh, raises cortisol, it lowers testosterone, which is particularly bad for men. Uh, and and long-term stress actually changes the, uh, the structure of the the brain as well. So um, does all kinds of damage. And so one uh, one very positive and very practical use for meditation is to get r rid of the stress, to allow the stress to go, to get it out of the body and out of the mind, out of the consciousness. And um, you, I would say you can you could do that in in as little as really like five or ten minutes. Ten minutes certainly. There's no need to spend hours meditating. Um, uh, and when I meditate, I usually meditate for you know, twenty minutes at a time, maybe thirty minutes. Um, and as I say, maybe I do it once a day, maybe three times a day. But for unless you're a monk, there is no need to be meditating for hours on end. Uh, as I say, we move through these different states of consciousness. So we, we need to master these states and, and meditation can be part of that. It shouldn't be the, the whole thing. Just as you would not want to be asleep for 24 hours, you wouldn't want to be thinking rationally for 24 hours. I don't think you need to be in meditation for 24 hours. Yeah, I don't even know if that's possible. I mean, that would be quite it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll take your word for it. I still can't believe you've never had a Red Bull. No. Wow. It, I'll, so it tastes like medicine. I, I'm not a fan of it myself, but I've started meditating on a daily basis, but I do it at night. Um, when we had our session, you had talked about the, you know, when you first wake up in the morning, try to use that time and that state before you're fully. And I'm just not one of those people. Like when I wake up, my brain immediately starts, you know, the engine goes and I'm, my mind is already playing. Oh, yeah. What's the weather going to be like today? The dog's going to come in. I need to go for a run. Um, what outfit am I going to wear? Who am I going to be meeting with? It all just boop, 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 starts. I find at the end of the day. Um, I can put on a podcast or just listen to the sound of, you know, a rain loop um, yeah, and just really focus on my breathing. And as you said, there is that physical component that comes as well. And I, as someone who runs every morning, it feels so nice to like, you know, 
uh, flex the muscles in your feet all the way up to your face. I do these weird facial scrunches um, and then you just completely get the stress out and I boom pass out and my wife becomes insanely jealous because she's lying next to me. Now just imagine your partner, you know, breathing in and out and contorting their body and releasing and flexing and then bang falls like right asleep. But it is, it is super relaxing. And as you said, like I looked at it as a way of purging out all of those end of the day troubles and problems and just getting it's like squeezing a sponge and i'm fresh to start the next day yeah that's right absolutely yeah and that's the self-guided one the ones that i've started exploring and uh i I wanted to mention we initially had uh, brother milos uh jesiorski to join us for this meditations and freemasonry podcast we had a scheduling conflict uh milos has been a guest on the craftsman online podcast before uh we've talked about him as mj dorian and the creative codex podcast i listened to some of the episodes and he produces these beautiful guided meditation podcasts and that's where i wanted to take the conversation with you as to guided meditation yeah so well in regard to the uh, type of guided meditation that we did um, which is sometimes called a path working um, we did some little ones before that where we were just focusing on visualizing symbols um, but then the main one we did was a, a, a path working where um, I guided you along in your mind's eye uh, along a, a, a journey um, in a certain landscape. They're really like visually rich and um, kind of use the other senses in the mind's eye to create a kind of impactful um, environment. So, uh, and there can be a purpose to it or, uh, um, you know, I mean, it shouldn't be done just for purely entertainment, but uh, you know, obviously there are other benefits, as, as I say, like even there would be relaxation. So, but um, yeah, it is in a sense to kind of immerse yourself in this other kind of world of the imagination. When we talk about meditation and Freemasonry, there are some aspects to a lodge meeting that now that I've started practicing this uh, process, um, I'm identifying it. So like one of them would be uh, the chamber of reflection that we would have for uh, a brother or a candidate before they enter the lodge. They're supposed to enter that space and meditate on why they want to be a Freemason. Then for those of us that have already made that journey are now inside of a lodge. There are some moments where you could say the lodge is almost meditating in the opening ceremony of the lodge as it's beginning to prepare the men who are in attendance that night to use our minds and contribute to the meeting. So I'm interested if if you have found any other ways to connect Masonic ritual to the concept of meditation. Yeah, I personally don't really connect the two. I have done one guided meditation in Compact Lodge. Uh, where we use Masonic symbols and Masonic initiation. Um, So it's definitely possible. Can you tell us, I mean, without giving away any (laughs) big secrets, like what, what, maybe what the topic was or um, what the process was like? Sure. So I did it with um, the the large master masons. So uh, I I basically did a guided meditation, a path working, um, in a sort of reliving the initiatic experience and going to the lodge, but also contemplating on uh, what you want in life and who you are as well. So trying to combine this sort of me- mental visual imagery with sort of uh, thinking about who, who each person was as an individual as well uh, to go forward in, in life with a little more certainty and direction. We would like to release a podcast episode that is guided meditation for Craftsman Online listeners. Right, right. You want me to talk about that, I assume, right? <laughs> yes, I do. this is the big one. Yeah. We have to put it out in the universe so it can happen. I think we've tentatively decided to do um, a path working uh, going back into 18th century London and uh, maybe visiting some kind of um, lodge such as uh, an Egyptian right lodge. Uh, So yeah, so uh, they'll be able to experience that in their mind's eye if they uh, so choose. And I can't wait because (laughs) Brother Milos does such a great job with the production, like Mm -hmm. even down to like the footsteps of walking and um, the what was the bowl, the Tibetan um, singing bowls. It really is. And and you talked about don't use it 
for the entertainment value of meditating. And I don't want people that are listening to just run out and start. But it, I think it is important to have that authentic, submersive experience. And once you have that, if you had any mm-hmm. holdups about yeah. doing this, thinking this is going to be mm-hmm. silly, people are going to see me standing or lying down. When you go through it and you have a, an, a wonderful experience, you cannot wait to do it again. And that's how you start to build a good habit. And that's really the right. gift that I want to share with you know men that are listening to our podcast or just anyone who's right. listening is yeah. um, your mental health matters. And we've okay. all experienced <laughs> uh, just an upended, mm-hmm. crazy, almost two years. Um, and for some of us, the, the effects of the public health emergency are going to continue yeah. until there really is a general return to normalcy. <clears throat> And when that happens, um, we're, we're going to have another issue of yeah. you know, folks trying to reacclimate to what the past life was. But for right now, um, I'm aware of a lot of brothers and a lot of friends and colleagues who are picking up very bad habits as a way to try to cope with the stresses in their daily life. And I would rather hear them talk about meditation and be turned on to that yeah. than making frequent daily trips to the liquor store, to be blunt. For sure, of course, yeah. Although I would, I would say, uh, obviously, we're not doing it to for any medical reasons. But, but um, you, you know, I think um, I get a little nervous for another reasons when it, when um, I hear sort of like mental health and medical. Um, but from the fact that I'm not qualified to deal with that, uh, leaving that aside, I think uh, this is this is also one of the problems of of the contemporary era and that is we kind of we're always thinking about well how can i how can i get back to normalcy whereas you know yeah med- meditation will help you cope with stress that is absolutely true and it's better than going out and drinking that's also very true but uh, the the real benefit of meditation is that not that you can get back to normal but that you can actually improve yourself and have great greater um conscious experiences or greater experiences of life and um you know if you think about moving through these different states of consciousness throughout the day um we do that because they actually have benefits for us they're not just we're drifting in and out of different states of consciousness and and i can tell you um i mean i know that you were very inspired and energized after we did hypnosis and that has had a long-term effect on you uh you know positively and, um, you know, as for myself, I can tell you that sometimes w- when I'm wrestling with some kind of um, um, intellectual problem, um, I haven't quite solved it, I've been thinking about it. If I, if I stop and I sit down and I meditate, I let my mind go blank, um, very often I'll have to just get back up and write down what's come to my mind because then I've got the solution. Or And sometimes it's happened that, you know, I've been sitting down to meditate and I constantly am getting back up because all these ideas are now flowing and, uh, and, and they have not been flowing when I've been thinking about it logically or I've been trying to tackle it head on. Suddenly you clear your mind and you, you get what you know, people often call inspiration. All of the solutions will start coming to you. And, uh, and we've been trained to always think that, no, there's a problem, I've got to hit it head on, head on. These other states of consciousness are precisely uh, what enable us to find solutions uh, when the, when head, tackling something head on isn't working. I mean, you've probably watched uh, Mad Men. There's a great scene in there where uh, Don Draper tells his assistant, uh, Peggy, who has just taken up uh, copywriting for him. And he says, just think about it, you know, intensely. You might not use that word, but just think about it. Uh, for a while, then forget it, and the idea will just jump up in your face. He says, and everybody who's creative knows that's true. That if you if you are a musician or an artist or you're a physicist or whatever it is, um, if you focus intensely on it and then forget it, once you've forgotten that, that's when you get the answer. That's because you've gone into a different state of consciousness, and the subconscious is working in a different way or coming through. So, so you know, well, the point of meditation is not to kind of fix us, it's to actually uh, help us use these other states of consciousness to be more uh, and more complete and more in control and more able to push forward in life 
uh, in a way that's dynamic and useful to us uh, that, than we would be if we just thought, you know, meditation nonsense. I'm sticking with pretend rational thinking, you know. But one thing I found with uh, meditation, and I've started embracing this phrase more frequently, is the idea of positive intent. Mm-hmm. And with by by meaning my, the meaning of that is is that um, instead of I think we have a time when something happens in life we tend to look at the negative impact or the why did this happen to me or why is this problem or this issue presenting yeah. itself. And the positive intent is looking at on the other side and saying whether it's a person who has done an act or or done something or just a random occurrence in the universe, this is an opportunity for me to improve. It's a challenge. It's something to overcome. So that's the positive intent side of it. And and as, as a Mason, one of the things that I embrace is the idea of we're always told before any great or important undertaking, we're supposed to pause and ask for the aid of, of deity. And I look at meditation as kind of a, a step towards that, to where it's giving me the chance to stop. And I think like George Washington is, you know, and I know we've talked about this, like he's one of the most historical figures and he's the, you know, most famous Freemason probably ever. And I'm sure he had bad days and I'm sure he was in very tough and difficult moments. And history will always look back on him glowingly and lovingly as this wise person. But perhaps maybe some of the things that he was known for with his character of being calm and a rational thinker was that he would take the time to study or self-reflect before making these important decisions. And that's one practice that whether that's happened, whether that's true or not, it's something that I'm trying to make a part of my life. So um, I want to thank you for that because that was one of the the big life lesson building blocks you get later on as an adult that you don't you think that you've you're done learning you're not going to learn and it was a, a new way of thinking for me to go okay let me take some time to really think about this when i have time to clear my mind and make a a smart rational decision if you try and tackle everything with this sort of deductive reasoning it, it works for some things but it's not going to work for everything and you need to shift between these states of consciousness and if you can calm yourself down and uh, just clear your mind before you tackle something um, that may be a challenge then you're probably going to be more likely to succeed or, or have some kind of positive vision for what you want to succeed and then go forward um, there's a uh, one of the sort of founders of modern the modern positive thinking movement, Emil Kue, um, he pointed out that if you lay a plank on the floor, everybody can walk along the plank without any problems. But if you put it up between two ladders high up in the air, no, all of a sudden most people are going to be afraid to walk across that plank, even though it's physically no more difficult than when it was on the floor. But the 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 image of falling and breaking your leg whatever it may be, um, prevents you from doing that. And so, you know, so having a a positive, uh, uh, positive image of what you want to happen and, you know, being able to master your mind and your thoughts to a much larger degree, uh, is definitely going to help you in every aspect of life really. This has been the Craftsman Online Podcast. I want to thank again, my guests for coming on this week, Brother Angel Millar. Thank you for your time. I know this is a a busy season for you as you're getting ready for the publicity for your next book. I want to get you back on the podcast so we can talk about that as it's coming out. What's the new title for the book? It's uh, The Path of the Warrior Mystic, Being a Man in an Age of Chaos. And I say it's a busy time because Brother Millar is creating a lot of content right now on his website, which is angelmillar.com. We'll get the link to that in our show notes. As we get ready for the pre-order for the book, you can do that right now on his website. The new book will be available for sale on November 9th. And I am looking forward to getting you back on the Craftsman Online podcast before the end of November to talk about your new book. Great, great. Awesome. And just another note, if you want to reach out to Angel to talk more about how hypnosis, meditation, or how he can mentor you through a personal or professional challenge that you're having, you can do so through his website as well, angelmillar.com. A reminder that new episodes of the Craftsman Online podcast are available every Monday morning. Until we talk again next time, let peace and harmony prevail.